Hello, and welcome to episode number 136 of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Today, I conduct a conversation with a Mexican conductor who came from a musical family, but initially at least did not study music. He has held title positions in the United States and Mexico, and just this summer he appeared at the BBC Proms conducting the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain. It's a great pleasure to welcome Carlos Miguel Prieto. Carlos, it is lovely to meet with you and chat with you today. How are you? I'm, I'm fine. Thanks. Thanks for the chance to join with you, uh, Michael, with this beautiful project. Not a problem at all. You're at home in Madrid. You've got a week off before what you described as a fairly crazy summer. Um, I know you've got the National Youth Orchestra ahead of you, but what else have you got planned for the summer? Uh, well, actually, my my real home, I, I have a temporary home here in Madrid. We have a small apartment. Uh, but my home is in Mexico City, and I have this orchestra. It's called Mineria Orchestra, uh, which is a really fabulous world-class orchestra. And we have a 10-week summer season which if you look at it, it it won't look to you like a summer season because yeah. we're doing we always do uh huge uh huge programs so we have i i'm doing um uh, i believe seven of them um and they're really great programs Good. Uh, for the first time for the first time i i i decided to do on two weeks um don quixote and heldenleben which is really cool that is uh, cool yeah because they they didn't let me to do it in the same week, which hmm. was my dream and and Strauss's dream, by the way. Uh, but I, I then I said, okay, the next best is one week and and one week, um, which is uh, something I really look forward to. But every week is is really unique, and that orchestra is 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 a, plays in a beautiful hall, is in its forty five forty fifth year. And I'm about to ha- be there for twenty years. And we always have really fantastic soloists and fantastic uh, recording projects and a couple of tours coming up. So, um, but it's it's nonstop. I mean, like yeah. the the rehearsals in Mexico are not like U.S. or U.K. where they're two hours or two and a half. They're three and a half hours, two hours, two times per day, which mm. means that you're rehearsing seven hours in a day. That's a lot. So it's. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Well, you, I mean, you mentioned Mexico, um, and it's where you're from. And regular listeners will know I always go right back to the beginning of your life. And I know that you do come from a musical family. Your father was a cellist, and I think your grandfather had something to do. He was on the board of a, one of the orchestras, I read. Yeah. And you were a violinist. Was music always going to happen? I mean, was the violin the first instrument you played, or what, did you go to piano at all? Oh, no, I've, I, I, I've never... I've never been able to play the piano or to sing correctly, which are two big uh, things for me. I, I, I think if I if I would have been able to play the piano, I, I I would have joined one of the many great conducting classes. But I I, I was never uh, taught to play the piano. But on the other hand, I do come from a family uh, which has music in its core for five generations, and that oh, wow. started in that started in Spain in. North of Spain and in France, um, and that started from my parental grandmother's side of the of the family, and always uh, tied to string quartet. Yeah. So my my grandparents met playing string quartet in the north of Spain. Then my grandfather went to Mexico for work, and my grandfather was kind of a Renaissance person, like like my father also is. Uh, and uh, he was a very enthusiastic violinist, much more enthusiastic than good, which I <laughs> should actually I, I, I love. OK, and I, yeah. I say that about myself, too. Uh, and he was also someone who made things happen as far to, as far as connecting people. And since music was his passion, he connected with people uh, like Carlos Chavez, who was one of his best friends in Mexico. And he hosted... I mean, literally at his home, Stravinsky, Mio, wow. uh, people wow. like that, Copeland. Mm. Uh, so my father, as a as a young man, remembers taking Stravinsky to see things around Mexico City, and 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 just talking to him about random things 
not yeah. necessarily music. So that was the kind of environment. Uh, my my grandfather, I think, um, was lucky to be part of a time in Mexico where Mexico was, I think Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina, or I, I should say Mexico City, Buenos Aires, and Rio, Sao Paulo, were uh, benefiting. I guess it's not nice to say benefiting, but were were important thing or uh, cities when the rest of the world had some really tragic things to deal with. Of course, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so, so Mexico City became an operatic capital, a capital of uh, symphonic music. Every quartet would come. And I, I, my grandfather was so enthusiastic and so part of the system that he would host them at his house or he would, you know, he, he had a, a sister who was a, a, a composer mm. who is now gaining a lot in, in importance. And uh, so it was a, it was, that's the kind of environment that I grew up with. I, I wouldn't say that kind of characters. Okay. I never met Stravinsky. I'm, I, it would have been impossible, but I did meet other people like whenever any string quartet would come to Mexico city. And those were the times where every string quartet would do series of concerts in Mexico city. Mm. When that, you know, maybe the only places where that happens today is New York, Paris, and London, and maybe Amsterdam and a couple of other places. But at that time, there would be the yearly Beethoven cycle by the Guarneri, by the, so all of these quartets would be invited to have dinner at, at our home. And then we would dare play mm. quartet with them. Can, can yeah. you imagine this? So, so it was, it's like uh, it's something that I, I, I'm even embarrassed to remember, but I'm <laughs> so, so privileged to have done things like that. Uh, and that was kind of the environment. And my father is still an important cellist and he is a, uh, uh, I mean, he's he's getting up there in in years, so he's not touring as much, but he's doing new new works. He's uh, he's been a force uh, ever since nineteen seventy something of commissioning incredible amounts of works and 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 premiering them, not necessarily in the you know capitals of the world, but th there is a world beyond the big uh, cities of classical music. But he has done a zillion premieres of all kinds of works in, in, in all, all kinds of places, but basically in the Spanish speaking uh, world and in the U S that, yeah. that, that's his, that's been his, his territory. He's also an important writer uh, and a writer who, who had interests, uh, has interests and was good friends with important writers who were living in Mexico city. Anyone who knows Mexico City knows that Mexico City is quite a um, cultured place, yeah. um, and uh, especially for literature, music, and of course any any kind of arts is mm. is an important place. Um, and my father's been a, a part of that, and I would say that I also a little bit inherited that that privileged situation which doesn't mean anything is easier <laughs> but you you know you you have access to things that are um i would say special yeah yeah i mean going back to quartets and eventually we're going to come to orchestras of course your violin playing life your violin playing career did you see yourself as wanting to go into chamber music more than being an orchestral player, or even we? Did you have designs of being a soloist? What What were you thinking when when you were holding a violin under your chin? Because yeah. I know I had no interest in being a string quartet player nor mm. being a soloist. Mm. I wanted to be an orchestral violinist, and that's what I became for twenty two years. Um, but I wonder, you know, what were you? What were your thoughts with the violin? I went to the French Lycée in Mexico City, which which was a school where um, when I was growing up, the perception is that if you were good in school, you were concentrating on science, okay, mm. math and physics and whatever. So that's, I don't mean to say I was good, but I, 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 I did concentrate on that. And then yeah. I, I kind of always told myself, I want to be an engineer. Uh, and, you, you know, it's this kind of thing where I guess I'm a, of an age where uh, 
vocational things were not discussed as openly as they are now. Mm. And, and that, you know, people were like sent in a certain direction without so much thought as, as perhaps today. Mm. Uh, and I'm saying this because I have kids the age of like 19, 17 and 13, and they get just from their school, a bunch of very interesting vocational uh, help that I never got. Mm. Because I think if I, if I would have gotten that help, I would have, I would have found out what I found out much later, mm. like a dozen years later or a decade later, which is that going through engineering school uh, and, and all the stuff I did um, was going to be fascinating, but it was not going to be what I was going to devote my life to. Mm. And for so I, I went to Princeton University, which is a very high level university in, in the US. And I studied electrical engineering. Mm. And I was part of a class that was really interesting. And that has made a difference. I mean, one of my classmates was uh, John, uh, Jeff Bezos, who started Amazon and who's pretty much changed changed our lives right? indeed yeah so, wow so yeah. so that there were people like that uh, in that school and princeton is also a liberal arts school in the u.s so not every class is engineering and i'll just tell you an anecdote to show you a little bit of what i lived through there and why this idea of having studied engineering was not necessarily bad mm. uh the, the the first year when you get there, the, the, you know, you're, you're called freshman. So yeah. the first year you're, you're, you're asked to do this uh, writing test. And the, the objective of this writing test is to see where you are placed in, in literature. Okay. Mm. Cause everyone has to have, I don't know, one, two or three, uh, you know, semesters of literature, no matter what you do. And most of the foreigners, including myself, get put in this class that sounds very elegant. It's called Lit 151, okay? Right. Literature 151. It should be called Remedial English, okay? <laughs> but that's, that, right. that's, that's, that's what we were put in. Okay, so the first, this is September 1983, in beautiful campus in New, in New Jersey, in Princeton, New Jersey. I mean, just imagine this green, beautiful campus. And we're a dozen kids who all think very highly of ourselves. And there was one Salvadoran, one Mexican, one Spanish, one Russian, a couple of Americans. Uh, and th those were 12 kids. And we have this teacher who the first day says, darlings, because that's how she always addressed us, darlings, I'm going to read to you Faulkner outdoors. Okay, so I don't know if you've read Faulkner, but... No. Yeah. Falk, Faulkner to a non-English person. I would say Faulkner to a non-US Southern person right. is as complicated as it is for me to read and try to understand Shakespeare. Okay. Mm, mm. So okay. So it is complex from every single point of view. But she would read to us these beautiful things and she said, I, I want you to just relax and not feel like you need to understand it. You you just kind of feel the music of the words. Mm. Anyway, long story short, this semester changed my life as far as my viewing of literature and my viewing of so, so many things. This author won the Nobel Prize two years later. Her mm. name was Toni Mor Tony Morrison, who is you know deceased and one of the great names of literature uh, in, in the US. And that's the kind of environment that you are put in there. OK, mm. it's also an environment where no matter what you do, you are at the bottom of your class if you are someone like me. OK, which mm. means that you are not like top, top and whatever. So you really have to work and you really have to be careful what you say, because whatever you say is going to be destroyed. So I had four years of that and four years also of a, of a education which was eye-opening in every sense of the word. It was eye-opening, maybe in the, in the same way that it is for kids today with the Me Too movement. Yeah. Only then it was, a, it was another movement. So 
I grew as a human being in those four years in a way that I would never have grown if I would have gone to conservatory. Okay? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And so, so I'm, I'm not like, you know, making excuses for not having studied music in conservatory. That I'm beyond that. Yeah. But w- what I'm saying to you is that I am kind of the living example of the fact that you can study something else, yet if you find out what your dream is or what your vocation is, eventually make a decision. Mm. So I, I actually speak with a lot of young people about this issue, and I, I'm asked by universities and by conservatories to, to talk about this. And what I tell them is, okay, if you know when you're 17 or 18, just go for it. Don't mm. don't hesitate. Don't don't listen to people who tell you that you have to be in economics or whatever. Just listen to your inner self. But if you don't know, open up your chances, open up your experience as much as possible because no there's no one who's going to tell you that you know you that your life is not going to go here there or everywhere which is my case if you would have told me when i was when i was 20 that i was going to be a conductor i would have you know asked you okay let's go have a beer and you tell me what you're smoking or eating or or (laughs) drinking you know but but but, you know yet a dozen years after that i was conducting 110 120 concerts a year okay What, what, is that success or not? I, I don't know, but that's just the way life took me. And uh, maybe I think that today with our young people, we try to put them into a very tight uh, path, uh, assuming that that's the path that they want to take. Yes. Uh, while uh, sometimes the path of our lives uh, is determined later in life especially for those of us who were not lucky enough to know our vocation early. It's almost the mantra of this podcast is how everybody's journey from the very opening, which is why I always go back to the very beginning of your life, to becoming a conductor. That journey is different for every single person. You brought up an, uh, interesting points that we had here with my eldest daughter, who was a very talented singer and percussionist, but also very talented at science. And we said to her, you know, you can always go back to music, but you can't always go back to science. So she went and got a biomedicine degree and she's <laughs> loving biomedicine. She's got a, you know, a, a master's as well. But the music is is coming back now. She's playing with amateur orchestras and things like that. And it, and you're so right in the fact that, you know, our paths change. I, if you'd have asked me on the day I joined the CBSO, do you know you're going to leave and become a conductor later on? Like you, I'd have said, well, why? I've just I've just got my dream job as a violinist. I'm going to be here until I'm 65 and I'll retire. As it turns out, that wasn't going to be the case. And you should just, just, should just let it, you know, let your life go on the path it goes on. I mean, talking to Masters, you did do one in business admin at Harvard. So you went to Princeton yeah. and Harvard. Yeah, which is 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 yeah. like it's it's a craziness beyond. OK, so yeah. and, and actually, you know, if anyone knows the atmosphere and the environment of Harvard Business School, it is one with, that puts you in contact with about 60 to 70 people who are in this semi-circular room mm. where you discuss cases from all kinds, uh, everything from uh, something as 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 primitively business like Nike, okay, uh, mm. similar, the, the same case of the, that there's a movie now out that's called Air that talks about that case. It's a very interesting managerial case, but also human case, mm. uh, but also po- political things, uh, et cetera. And you are put into this situation where half of your grade is depending on your oral participation. Yeah. And, and, you know, we all think of ourselves perhaps higher than we should Mm. and we all think that if we open our mouth and say the first thing that comes into our minds it's going to be great okay well in that environment it it, it's not Mm. Uh, because there are 65 people who are looking to find holes in your arguments and whose grade is going to go up if they destroy you with a right argument and Again, that's another experience which also also shaped me. Yeah. But it shaped me in a way that I would never have imagined. 
right. which is the fact that because that is such a academically intense um, atmosphere, I needed to go to every single concert of the Boston Symphony, including some rehearsals, as I could. Yeah. So I found a way to have access to all the open rehearsals and any concert I any concert I wanted to go to, which means that I went to an incredible amount of concerts. I did the same thing at Princeton with New York Philharmonic Metropolitan Opera. And that, along with what I got from my father, was my was the seed that was planted in my love of symphonic music. Mm. And uh, because since I was in these very strict academic places, for me, my way out was music. Mm. And it was music that was not necessarily playing the violin. I, I can play the violin well, okay? And yeah. I still do. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not that. But it's not... Uh, I never... I never learned Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto to perform it, okay? Mm, mm. So I, I but one of my loves from an initial a, a date in my life was to learn as much orchestral repertoire and remember them. So I would teach myself the nine Beethoven symphonies up to the point where I could tell which movement of which symphony was what okay yes yeah. uh, and then tchaikovsky Mahler, pretty much everything uh everything in the core repertoire yeah so although i was not working as a conductor or doing as a conductor early on by the time i started conducting i already knew basically the core repertoire mm. okay which is scary because sometimes you learn it in a way that is wrong yes oh god yes okay? yes yes absolutely agree with that <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so i mean like you can think that that uh you know it's go it, it's si sol mi do yeah. la fa while it's the other way around okay yes. so yeah. this in a way i, I tell young people okay because I get this question asked a lot. You probably do too. What do I do to become a conductor? Okay, so I, I basically say, do whatever you can to learn as much music as possible. Mm. Whether that means inside an orchestra, inside a youth orchestra, in, inside a amateur orchestra, no matter what, just put yourself in the situation where you learn in your ear you know, sucks up all this magic of the repertoire that, that we have. And also do as much at whatever level, okay? Yeah. If you have a chance to conduct a, 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 a wind ensemble that's a beginner wind ensemble in a, in a train station, do it. Or, yeah. you know, do it, do it in a hospital. Do it whatever because it's a way to learn because finally what you and I are asked to do is to make things possible for an orchestra. Mm. Whether we are like, you know, artistically, whatever, we need to get them from A to Z. And the way you need, the way you learn about this is first understand the relationship of sound and, and, and gesture, which, which you only need, which you only can do doing. Yes. But you also need this kind of knowledge of the repertoire from, from, from the basics okay my, my theory I, I somebody asked me yesterday can you or 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 should you conduct a Mahler symphony before you conduct conduct a Haydn symphony I would I would say okay well you probably can but you will understand much more Mahler if you understand Haydn than if you first understand Mahler and then go from Haydn yeah. So my my upbringing was as meat and potatoes as it gets. Okay, <laughs> Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, from there on. Yeah, and yeah. you can call it conservative or whatever, but it, that basis has been for my life like the basis upon which everything is built.
Well, I mean, you know, staying on there briefly, but I'm going to ask a six million dollar question in a minute. But you know, you're you're a much better conductor of Bruckner if you've conducted Schubert. I say as well. Yeah, you know, they're, course, they're, yeah. they're linked. Um, but the six million dollar question is: How does somebody who's got a degree in electrical engineering and a master's in business administration then end up being a conductor ten years later? How did you do that? And why? And you said that the, the seed was sown. But there must have been a moment when you thought, I'm going to give this a go. How do you do that? How do you go to Tanglewood and the Piano on Tour School um, and change your uh, life direction? The, the, I don't know that I have the $6 million answer. But <laughs> well, I, I, three I, million's I, fine. <laughs> three million. Let's say, let's say 30, yeah. 30 cents. Okay? Okay. <laughs> but my answer is, if, if you have a dream, you just stick to that dream and the dream takes you yeah through okay so uh, you know I, I i'm also a huge fan of sports like hmm, like me uh, too hu okay huge so i i like seeing the lives of like super incredible athletes and 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 what they say what what makes lebron james or or what makes uh i'm not going to go to football because you know there's so many but what what makes someone who is such an extraordinary talent be that versus the next level which is already super extraordinary it's the dream mm. and it's the dream and the believing in yourself okay and i think that you can believe in yourself and trust that you will find a way at whatever level you don't need to be lebron james i mean lebron james dream was to be the best ever basketball player. I mean, that's that that was his dream when he was thirteen. Okay, mm. so so his his ceiling was not the school championship. Yeah, I mean, his ceiling has not yet achieved. Mm. So uh, that is the reason why, at age thirty eight today, which for his profession is very old, he can still do things that are that will mesmerize you because his his dream is so big. So uh, I, I believe that if you if you dream and if you trust yourself, you will find a way. So don't ask me why the Pierre Montes School. I, I just found a way to there. And I'm not saying that that's an ideal or not ideal place, but it's the place that accepted me. And for six summers, for eight weeks every summer, I played violin in an orchestra and conducted every single conceivable thing and that was my way to learn this trade and also little by little get invited by orchestras first first because of a cancellation and then because things just happen but it's this dream it's it's not that okay i want to do chai four no i want to do chai four at this level yeah I'm not even I'm not even gonna say at the level I don't want to I, I've never dreamed of conducting X orchestra. Okay. Yeah. I've dreamed of being able to do a piece at X level. Yes. And 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 that's I think that's what takes you. And that's it's so I've always given a lot of importance and it's a big motivating factor for me how an orchestra goes from rehearsal one to the last rehearsal how much how much is achieved mm. rather than you know if an orchestra starts here and ends here okay it's fine but my way of thinking is always building mm. uh, and and i i've been music director of several orchestras and building for me is a very important thing and so building in your own life is I think the way to to grow yeah. and also to feel that you will get all kinds of information from the external world that what you are doing is impossible. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. And, and yet the only person, only person who knows whether it's possible, it's, it's you. That's right. I, I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to sound here like some kind of, cheap uh, you know motivational uh, how to book but uh, it, in my life it is it, it was very clear 
at, at an age where I had already achieved certain success in business, I completely started from scratch and something else, but something inside of me told me you are able. And uh, almost 30 years later, I can tell you that I have gone to places that I would have never dreamed. I, I would have never dreamed the first time I ever put together Tchaik Four, Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony, was with an orchestra where I had to do a sectional with the horns for the opening. Okay. Wow. That's, okay, that's so, a starting place. Yeah. Okay. So, and and after 25 rehearsals, Tchaikovsky Fourth sounded exciting. Okay. Yeah. And everyone was excited. Well, three weeks ago, I was able to do it with Chicago Symphony. It, it was not the first time I do it with them and they do it in their sleep. Mm. But when you do that, you say, okay, this is kind of a dream come true. Okay. And this is something that I can be proud of. Uh, and that tells me that with my kids, I can tell them, look, if you want to do this, just trust yourselves. You know more than me. You know more than your mom. We, we, we think we know what you, what you can do, but only you know. Yeah. If you don't know, then, you know, ask around. But I, I, wish, I wish I would have known at the age that, like, Gustavo knew. Okay, so I met Gustavo when he was a teenager. All yeah. right. he, already, he already knew he wanted to be, uh, you know, the god of conducting today well, you, much you, like simon so, metal did They're exactly the same yeah, exactly yeah, but so, yeah. Uh, yeah so it's a if you have that unique situation that puts you always in extremely unique circumstances you, you just run with it you know it's like 100 yard dash you know it's like mm. just go but if 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 you don't i think you have to take this very um slow path of believing in yourself mm -hmm. and slow means that some of the results will come much later than you think mm. but they come yeah i mean it's sticking with your lebron james you know with there not being a ceiling on his ex expectations of his basketball career it's very important that you re approach rehearsals like that you know with the orchestra going back to your trike four you know, you start off and it's so bad and you think, well, where can this go? But there is still no ceiling. But then you stand in front of the right. Chicago Symphony Orchestra and it's instantly, in, you know, probably <laughs> incredible. But there is still no ceiling above that because you can always make it better. You can always take it to a different place. You can always take it to a different level. Uh, and so, yeah, you should, you know, you, you I, I'm much the same as you. I've conducted a lot of youth orchestras and amateur orchestras in the past and still occasionally now. And I never put a ceiling on anything. You know, you keep working, you keep pushing, you keep going because there's always something else you can you can add on to the list. You know, the list doesn't it, there isn't a bottom line of that list saying you know now do concert we, we, you you are finished. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you can always add things on the bottom of that list before you walk out there at seven thirty for the concert. Finally, right. um, you know, that, and that it's very important. Um, I want to just stick around with the four names that are listed on your Wikipedia page and see if any of them are really bigger influences than any others. I mean, a few of these names, one of them has actually been interviewed for this podcast, but a few of the names have appeared before, especially Charles Brook, because he's taught two or three or four people on, the, on who I've interviewed. But there's Charles Brook, <laughs> Jorge Mes, uh, Mesta, uh, Michael Jinbo, a name I don't know, and Enrique Dimec, who I have interviewed. Um, okay. So which of those... Uh, four names do you think were probably the biggest influences as a teacher and a mentor? Well, two two of them passed. Okay, so yeah, yeah. so uh, only one can get offended. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I I would say that each one, yeah, in their own thing. Okay, so if yeah. you've interviewed Enrique, Enrique is a very passionate, yes, uh, spur of the moment. Person. Fellow Mexican, yeah. Fellow Mexican, yeah. Jorge Mester, who is also fellow Mexican, although uh, he's made his career outside, is a very, very, very incredibly technical preparer of orchestras. So yeah. I, I would say that if you if you ask me which one is the biggest influence, mm. would be George Mester. Yeah. Okay? Because I also worked 
as his assistant in Mexico for about four years. And by that, it meant that for four years, he would conduct 16 weeks a year and I would conduct 30. Mm. Okay, wow. because that's that's how it was. And yeah. and 30, that's when I started conducting Turangalila. I started conducting Mahler and a bunch of things that were perhaps way beyond uh, my, my capabilities. But it was with the orchestra of the city of Mexico, very high level orchestra, but also government funded. Mm. So we could just go crazy. Yeah. Uh, and he, he, I would say he was a mentor in, in, in the way that a, a coach would be for, for an athlete. Mm. Um, Sean Brook was a old school teacher, old school in every sense. And that instilled with me the responsibility of conducting. Mm. He had this, if you've interviewed some of his conductors, you know that he instilled this kind of fear. Yeah, and this, exactly, also yeah, this yeah. kind of, it, it, with this, this French accent that was thick, he would just look at you. And he, if anything went wrong, it's you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And he taught me, yes, it's me. But he also taught me to overcome that eventually. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thankfully, when I when I was with him, I was about maybe ten years older than some of the other people who were with him, who got completely destroyed and I would even say affected by right. his teaching. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. He he uh, he was a kind of teacher that you know some people still believe in. I think it's 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 a bit passé today. Uh, this mm, this mm. Uh, fear fear instilling teacher that says, okay, uh, if you can't stand me, you're not cut for this business. Okay, mm, that mm. that was his way. But I had gone through the French lycée, which which is like that, and I you know I had already graduated from these places we talked about, so I, I had a thick skin. Mm. Uh, in in a way, I I I could see beyond the fear. Um, and Michael Jimbo was the con the continuation of Shaw Brook and also very, very hands-on, uh, much more gentle, mm. but hands-on. But, but so everyone in, in, of those four uh, was, was partly mentor. But if I had to say, if, if you ask me who was your conducting teacher, I would say George Mester. I'm going to I'm going to jump ahead because there's a question leaping off my notebook um, because I'm not sure I've ever had this situation. But working out from the dates, I mean, you said it. you started 98, you become the music director of Mexico City Philharmonic Orchestra. And basically, from that day onwards, you've had a music directorship in Mexico. Uh, you've got one of uh, the orchestra, Sinfonica de Mine Mineria. Um, Mineria. And also, yeah, National uh, Symphony of Mexico as well. But between 03 and 06, you become assistant conductor with the Houston Symphony Orchestra. So back home in Mexico, you're a music director. You're running the show. You're running the ship. You're steering the car. <laughs> but then you go and do three years as an assistant in the US. That must have been mentally quite... I mean, I know you just said you've got a thick skin, but that must be quite difficult to, you know, pop home or, or, or you know, be regularly in contact and dealing with music directorships whilst you're sitting in watching other people rehearse and doing assistantship in Houston. How did you manage that? Well, the, the thing is that in Houston, I was not, I was offered something in Houston, which was perfect for me. And, yeah. and it wasn't an assistantship in the sense that today assistance would be. Right. It okay. would be, it was more like conduct eight weeks yeah. of everything from uh, concerts that, that were for the Latin community, uh, one subscription and educational concerts. Yeah, so yeah. It, it wasn't. I don't think I've ever done a week. I don't mean that they're not valuable. I don't think I've ever done a week of assisting. Okay? Right. Okay. And, and yeah, so yeah. It, it, yeah. it wasn't that kind of thing. But again, it leads me to another thing is if something is interesting, why say no because of status? 
Yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah, because yeah. what what is status? Okay, mm. when you are placed in front, it, it, if if I were just placed right now in front of the Berlin Philharmonic, okay, just let's let's just assume that happens. Uh, they don't they don't care that you know I was music director here or there or that I've done whatever. That's they just what you do there right yeah they want and you it, to and, do the job that you do uh, and, exactly uh, yeah. and, and and it's soon forgotten where you're from or whether you speak german or not it's just it's, it's 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 the chemistry or the magic of what we do that gets us mm. to do it and that chemistry happened uh, in houston in a very beautiful way which also opened doors in the united states and i i think one thing about my career which i'm proud of is that I've kind of gone up through the ranks. Uh, mm. I, the, the first music directorship was in Huntsville, Alabama. And that is actually, that is a very fine orchestra in a place that is a very scientific place in the U.S., but it's a building block. Uh, mm. It's a building orchestra, and it's an orchestra that I actually am very proud of having taken to the next level. Uh, but, you know, my career path has not been the career path of someone who suddenly is being put in front of an orchestra like Chicago and thinks that I am the one who makes them sound good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I would also suggest to young people is know where you can make a difference and what is it's, Let's say I I know a few people in this in this uh, world or this business that we do that's not a business uh, that think that conducting is getting to a level where you're always conducting very good orchestras and that's it, uh, which is very nice. But I I think it's very important to know as a musician that you can make a an orchestra do something when that orchestra probably couldn't do it without you mm, okay absolutely and, true. and the, 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 you know actually I, i'm going to go into a sports analogy which which is probably odd but it is timely uh, last night a coach the coach of sevilla beat Sevilla beat Roma, Roma in, yeah. in UEFA. Mm. So this coach um, is his first time coaching a first league, professional league team in Spain. Mm. He took over Sevilla a month or two ago when they were barely going to stay in first division. Okay, he made them not only stay in first division but win the the Europa Cup last yes. night and mm. and beat and beat the ultimate jerk of a coach, which is Jose Mourinho. Okay, <laughs> yeah, and, absolutely. And, yeah, and actually, not only I I should not say jerk of a coach, but like the ultimate super coach. Okay, mm. and, and this guy is a guy who made it through third division, junior teams, et cetera, et cetera. I have the greatest admiration for people like that, mm. but, but also in our profession, okay? I, 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 I attend as many concerts of people who are putting together concerts at, at, at university level, at conservatory level, or even below, because mm. I think that is a beautiful part of our profession. Okay, and as much as I adore the other side, which is the the higher echelon, I also adore this the the side that of of the high school conductor, the band conductor, uh, the mentor, and those people are actually the ones that I get so much inspiration from, mm. uh, and, and you know just because. I could tell you that as as much as I admire someone like Claudio Bado or someone like Leonard Bernstein, I I actually admire people who nobody has heard about because of what they can do 
with a band. Okay. Yes. Uh, and we all have experiences like that in our personal life. You probably have. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet they, they don't make it to the papers. They don't make it to, they, they're like hidden heroes. Mm. Uh, yet every orchestra is filled with people who are there because of these hidden heroes. Mm. And, and I have my own hidden heroes. And, and, and those are actually very important for me. And they provide inspiration in moments that we all have, which are tough. Mm. You know, moments where you may have a rehearsal with an excellent orchestra who just hated you. And who just, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's, where, that's where you say, hey, I... I, I I get it. You know, yeah. I, I know. So if if I can deal with two hours like this, if someone like one of these hidden heroes deals with that for years, yeah, yeah, yet it, builds something. It's also worth pointing out that some of those hidden heroes go undiscovered and wish they could conduct the sort of orchestras that you and I conduct. But then there are others who have no in ambition at all to do what you and I do. They're very happy doing their school bands or their, their counter youth orchestras or their whatever they might well be doing um, because that's the level of music making they love and they wouldn't want to fly around the world doing what we do, um, you know, guesting. They, they, they're happier because they've formed a bond and a relationship with one group and, the, and, and, and they do magical things with it. Uh, right. You know, that, that's the great level. The great thing about what we do is that there are levels of conductors... And just because you conduct the Berlin Philharmonic and the Chicago Symphony Orchestra doesn't make, you know, it's not, it's, you know, of course you are, you have to be a great conductor to conduct those, those groups, but it doesn't mean that there aren't great conductors lower down, exactly like sports. So, you know, there are managers probably now who are just starting out in the second and third tier of British or Spanish or Italian football, who in 10 years time could be the guy who won for Sevilla last night, you know, who beat uh, Mr. Arrogant Mourinho. Um, you know, <laughs> Uh, who, who? Uh, as just before I pressed record, I was watching Sky Sports News, and it was all about the fact that he, he's, you know, he's been filmed uh, swearing loudly at the at the the referee, the English referee in the car park afterwards. You know that sort and, of and, behavior. And, and <laughs> what kind of what you know? If you agree that a coach or a conductor is is kind of an authority figure, right? Yeah, absolutely. Wh whether we like it or not. We yeah. are authority figures. What what we do impacts other people. Okay, mm. and, so, and how you behave. Yeah, in, in, and yeah. how you behave. Yeah. How, how do you tell a bunch of kids playing football in a school not to insult each other when the highest paid manager of the world <laughs> yeah. it, it insults the other team? Yeah. actually receives a, a silver medal, takes it off, and throws it to the stands. Throw it in the so, crowd, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think the same thing is in music. It, yeah. it, in music, every single thing we do is a huge responsibility. You, uh, and, you, you've led perfectly yeah. to my next question, if I okay. might butt in, which is to do with being a figurehead and a role model. You know, you've been um, and still are music director of... Two orchestras in America, but you've been a music director of three, which means you have to be a figurehead for that that community and that orchestra and go out and do funding or, you know, press the flesh, as they say. Um, uh, do you enjoy that, the the sort of uh, fundraising element, the sort of meeting the local philanthropists? And how much do you rely on that training all of those years ago of sitting in a semicircle at Harvard, um, you know, listening to other people, and, and having to say the right thing at the right time. Do you look back now and think, my God, I'm so glad I, I had that experience for when I, I'm stood in front of Mr. X and, or Mrs. Y who've got millions in the bank and we need to get some of it out of their bank? Right. I mean, the, there is no doubt that the fact that I studied business administration helps me uh, tell a, a potential fundraiser that they can devote to an orchestra uh, funds that that for accounting reasons they will offset from taxes or something like that. That there are technical things that help you, yeah. but there are other things which are probably deeper, which is speaking 
and understanding their language. Yeah. Uh, I, I just finished 17 years in New Orleans. My, my first year was a year after Katrina. I signed my contract a week before the Hurricane Katrina. Mm. Uh, and yet that has been a, an incredible success story uh, of an orchestra that's that you know was invited to play in Carnegie Hall because of its quality uh, and and that's just really excelled in in many many ways uh, attracting incredible um, young musicians and 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 losing a lot of them to the top orchestras but that's that's just the natural way that orchestras are mm. but uh, my I, I couldn't do what I do without understanding that I am responsible for leading the orchestra on the podium as as well as in the community. Mm. And that means leading uh, the face of what the orchestra should mean for the community, as well as how it relates to the people who have the power to help you. Uh, and I, 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 I Notice that I didn't say wealthy people because it's not always like that. No, of it's, course, it, no, no. It, 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 it's more like people who have the will to help. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think you can be a music director of an orchestra in the U.S. today. And I, I, I believe it's the same thing in the U.K. without understanding this huge responsibility mm. and without knowing how to speak to an audience of fundraisers, without motivating them without uh, knowing how to touch their hearts and just to convince them that giving funds to an orchestra is an essential thing, mm. just as essential as it could be to, to, to a nursing home or, mm. or, 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 or to an orphanage, you know, because uh, we have, we are in this world that other people perceive as highbrow elitist, um, and our responsibility is is to make sure that that stigma goes away. Mm. And, and how does it go away? I don't think it goes away in a simple way. I, it doesn't go away by wearing jeans. Okay, <laughs> no. it, it 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 goes away by doing everyday work that shows people that you care about the community. Mm. So in New Orleans. It wasn't that hard in in New Orleans. One of the tricks that I used is just using the wealth of musicians that are there. Because when I got there, the orchestra played with none of these geniuses. Some of them who are who passed. Uh, but I said, God, I mean, just just like in Mexico, I've worked with the best musicians in the non classical world. Hey, why don't we invite Fats Domino? Why don't we invite uh, Alan Toussaint, you know, or the, the father of the Marsalis, Ellis Marsalis? Mm. They, they've, they've got something to say. And we started this uh, cycle of, of working with great musicians that opened a whole new avenue to the orchestra and that also made the community understand that the orchestra is not just for a chosen few, yeah. but that it, it can be for everyone. As it should as, be, as it should be. I mean, of course, this is this is a slippery slope. You do, you don't want the Berlin Philharmonic to end up playing with polka bands every other week. That's not that's not <laughs> where I'm going. I mean, mm. They, but they have the very unique situation of having funding from a, from the state. They, they they can do what they do and survive. Yeah. Yet an orchestra that needs funds and that needs to convince politicians that they are essential needs to understand this role in education because unfortunately uh, music education is is less and less depending on schools since schools are not taking that initiative anymore and they are more and more depending on orchestras and music teachers so if orchestras don't lead that charge Kids don't have teachers. Kids don't have instructors. So I, I started all this campaign in New Orleans, uh, making sure that people understand that the 70 musicians from the orchestra have each one, I don't know, 10, 15, 16 students. Mm. 
Mm. And that these students were going to Juilliard. These students were going to wherever. I mean, a couple of these are today Grammy Award winners in in things that are not classical music, yet they had teachers from, from the orchestra. So as a music director, it is very important, I think, that you understand the leadership role that you have in a community that's perhaps extra musical. There is an 11th question, Carlos, which you probably don't know about before we get to the, the famous 10 questions at the end. The 11th yeah. question is something that we all do. Every single person I've interviewed does this, and that's score study. How do you go about studying a score? Do you start at the beginning, work your way through? Do you go big to small? And importantly, for the geeks, and trust me, there are geeks who listen to this podcast, <laughs> are you a red, blue, black pencil person and highlighters? Okay. Or do you keep your scores virginally white? What do you do? Uh, I see markings, I see highlighters, I see Copeland's Third Symphony and red and blue and okay. uh, symbols and yeah, exactly like me. Yeah, yeah, I'm a I'm a marker up, upper as well. Um, okay, yeah. so uh, and and actually, wow, you know, uh, yeah, well, you really, anyway, anyway. Yeah. more colors so, than uh, me, but they, they probably all mean something, and that's important. So, when my kids were growing up, um, they thought that what I was doing, because this is a very unique piece, so I've marked it up, but uh, like another piece that I may have would just have like, like red, red, green, and blue yeah. pencil. Yeah. Okay. And for me, red, uh, green is architecture. Yeah. Uh, red is instrumentation and blue is dynamics. Right. Or tempo, yeah. okay, but that's just my my. We it's all your have, system, yeah, yeah. system, but that is a way, I think, for me to teach myself the score, mm. and also to know that I don't need to look at it. Yeah, uh, you know. So, uh, I I would say that I go the same way that an architect would go for a building. I, I, I initially need to understand the structure. J yesterday, I gave a master class about Messiaen to Rangalila, mm. to a bunch of conductors. And, I, and they said, how do you go about understanding this piece? Well, you know, first of all, you know that you know nothing, and, uh, but that you have this genius piece of music and you do your own analysis. So I, I'm a firm believer in your own analysis with your own words, yes. okay? So Michael's words, my words are different. You may call it exposition. I may call it A. Mm. Uh, you, I can call it, you know, the, the entryway or whatever. So we all have a different language. And then from there on, you go into more and more and more and more detail. And then suddenly you're, you're inside the piece. But uh, more importantly, I think it is the idea that it is a lengthy search okay <laughs> that yeah, no matter how, yeah. how no matter how many times you've analyzed beethoven 5 or how many times you've done beethoven 5 it is a work in progress that you know that that will take more than more than the time you have absolutely i i i, I love i love telling this story about about george schulte and if if it's not schulte uh it's still a great story. It's like the, the Italians say, se non è vero e ben trovato. If it's not true, it's a good story. But <laughs> I heard it told told from George Schulte, who was conducting in Vienna, Beethoven V. And he had a very nice dinner uh, the night before one of the rehearsals. And he had told his the people who invited him for dinner, well, I can only stay for one hour. And then he was at dinner and he stayed for one hour. And then they said, okay, maestro, could we know why? I mean, what I have to go prepare Beethoven five. At, at, at that time, he had already recorded Beethoven five, five times, yeah. at least that I know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And done it. How many times is a wild guess, but, but more importantly, he could have been at a stage of saying, I'm George Schulte. Yes. I am one of the greatest living conductors. 
Beethoven five is a piece I know better than any one of these people. So then I, I, I don't need to do this work. Uh, I, I think that this score analysis is a huge part of why we are conductors. Mm. And that's the, indip- the individual part that those of us who are private cherish, okay? Mm. Because I think that maybe half of our lives are very public and the other half is very private. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. And the, yeah. The, the very private is the one you are talking about studying. And the last thing I do, which is actually enjoyable, is I I, I actually like like reading about other people's analysis of a work. Mm. Uh, and the, those can be some of the gods of analysis, which your, your country has many historic <laughs> ones. And I, I have their books and those are fascinating, but also people who may have written a thesis about something. Mm. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I just interviewed somebody who wrote a thesis about Elgar First Symphony, because I just conducted that piece, and told me things that well, maybe maybe they're not exactly true but they were great to learn uh and uh that's the part which is we should cherish as conductors that we we kind of have the same situation as a doctor that if we stop we are you know we limit ourselves yes the the yeah. day you, the day you and i think we know beethoven are are growing stalls uh, so I, I like thinking okay if maestro Scholti needed that time to work on beethoven five then um then i needed 10 times more <laughs> yeah. and, and I, 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 I'll, t- I'll tell you another another just a very practical anecdote At this point, as you've just heard, Carlos told me about a recent experience relating to whether to conduct from memory or not. We then went on to talk about how this can impact on how people view us as conductors and whether we should care about that or not. I've made this into a short bonus mini-episode for subscribers to my Patreon page. You can subscribe to my Patreon page for as little as £5 a month. You can also pay annually and get a 10% discount. And if you're a student, feel free to contact me and I will raise that discount further for you. Not only will you have access to all of the previous mini episodes attached to this podcast, you can listen to around 30 hours of interviews with prominent musicians, managers, agents and soloists. You can read my very popular tour diaries that I write when I go and guest conduct abroad, as well as articles about conducting and conductors. Just head to patreon.com forward slash a mic on the podium. That's P A T R E O N dot com. Details and links to the page are in the show notes attached to this episode. Now, the all important 10 questions with my guest, Carlos Miguel Prieto. Carlos, we've reached the 10 questions. And like <laughs> all, so many conductors before you, I will ask you what sound or noise do you love and what sound or noise do you hate? I, I love the sound of anything that comes from nature. Uh, and I hate anything that is repetitively technical, like um, reggaeton. Uh, that, that, is, that is supposed to be exciting because it's very loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so the more natural, the better. The sound of water... And the sound of the ocean to me is the most amazing sound of birds. Uh, I, I go to nature a lot and those sounds to me are the best. And the sounds that we force ourselves uh, on each other are the ones that I love the least. I, I, I've never understood why restaurants need loud music or <sighs> repetitive music. That's so I, 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 that that would be the two extremes. I, there are probably sounds that I hate even more, but those are the ones that, can, that come to mind. Number three, if you had 24 hours free, what would you spend it doing? If I, if I am anywhere within the vicinity of a skiing mountain, ah. I, I will go skiing. Yeah. If, if I am anywhere near a forest, I will go hiking. 
Mm. If I am in a city, I will go to the theater. Yeah. Okay. So those because those three are big passions of mine. Mm. I I I go to the theater very often and get huge inspiration from from the theater and from actors. Mm. I'm an avid skier and I'm an avid nature fan. So depending on where I am, those would be the third. Now, of course, the number one is any of those with my family. Can you name your favorite conductor or conductors of yesteryear? Leonard Bernstein is someone who I go back to often because of the combination of freedom and passion and uh, just communication mm. so that that he is one um i've always admire admired the last years of uh claudio abado mm. um hugely because i think he kind of found a relationship to music that was as much true to the written music as possible so I, I love, I love those those two uh, would would be up there. Mm. Of course, I grew I grew up adoring Karaya. Mm. Uh, so if if you ask me as far as a sound from an orchestra, yes, of course. Which yeah. the, I I think I think the big question is whether that sound comes from him or the orchestra. But we are conductors we have to stick with each other i think i think he was able to get that sound and shape that orchestra in in a way that very few conductors today can shape an orchestra also because of extra musical things of the way he was mm. but th those three for me are are kind of uh, uh sacred which which doesn't mean that there are others and another big name for me is pierre monteur i mean and 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 why? Because of his relationship with the music of uh, Debussy, Stravinsky, which is a big part of my life, and how how much he influenced music, I think, is is another. So I I would say that if if I keep going, the list will get bigger, and it will <laughs> include li living people. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but if if I had to say four, I would say Leonard Bernstein, Claudio Abado, Karajan, and Piamonte. Well. I hate to break it to you, but question five must include some living people. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, who oh. would be your favorite current conductors or conductor? One or more? I guess, I guess, I I would tell you conductors that I would go see mm. uh, and not miss. Okay, mm. which some of it is partly not really knowing how they do it. Yes, and one one is Gergit. Mm. And I fully understand that it's a it's a controversial name now, but I, you know, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, but I've I've seen him do magic um, in a way that I can't fathom how the orchestra plays. I, I'm sure you've been I asked see. like I'm sure you've been asked like <laughs> I've been asked. How are they playing on that beat? And I often I've had to say I don't know. I just yeah. don't know. I played for him when he was conducting like that before I retired <laughs> as a violinist. I played for him. And, and fortunate, fortunately, a lot of the music had inner impetus or inner pulse and rhythm, so I just wasn't watching him. But there was a, <laughs> there were some chords in the Berlioz Grand Messe des Morts, which the, 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 the wind and brass and percussion had to play, and the strings weren't involved with. And I sat, and I was I was already the assistant conductor of the CBSO at this point, so I was I was very interested in what he was doing. Very, very, very interested. And I was sat there watching, and I thought, no, I have not the first idea how they're playing together at all. And not only that, it was an orchestra which was half uh, the Mariinsky Orchestra and half the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra. So it, they weren't even used to playing together as an orchestra. But still, they played with this... I'm not even going to call it a beat... Carla, I'm, I'm just, I cannot call it a beat. Um, well, the, the, yeah. the, be, but magic happened the, in that concert. The, the, magic exactly. happened. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I think that that's something that I, I admire. I, I don't admire all his recordings, nor do I think that they're necessarily more idiomatic or anything, but there are some things that I've heard him do and seen him do, which are absolutely extraordinary. Um, and, and I... 
I have no, I, I have no doubt that it would, it's, it's, it, anything he would do would raise my eyebrows in, 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 in an interesting way. So uh, he is someone who, who I, I would, I would follow. And I, I also like, I mean, this is, this is a name that's probably going to be out of nowhere. I mean, he's a well-known person, but Herbert Blomstedt. Okay, who must be he, 90... his name is, yeah, his name is not out of nowhere. And I would say in recent <laughs> episodes, he I don't know whether it is because of his age and, and how youthful he is at the age of 95, 96. <laughs> yeah. But, but he's still loving every second of what he does, and orchestra seems to love what love being around him, you know. Um yeah. He is a name but, that's not come out of nowhere at all, but quite a few other conductors have mentioned him. And and you know, I I I, I would, although I've never, I've never really seen him uh, live. Uh, it, Simon Rattle is someone who who uh, who fascinates me in every sense, and mm. um, uh, I have to say that one of those senses is extra musical. I, I think, from what I can infer, you and I did not have the best of time during the pandemic. Uh, and he was open about this also. Uh, and uh, he was open about the fact that the pandemic opened his eyes to family. Mm. And I think that that's a very sane thing. And I also loved the things he did immediately after the pandemic, uh, placing the orchestra in a circular fashion. I, I must admit, I copied it you know, I plagiarized completely uh, doing, you know, virtual concerts with a circular orchestra, very mm -hmm. much like he did. So I think he's a he's one of these conductors who I would not who I would not miss mm -hmm. uh, out of the young generation. Of course, if I can see Gustavo, I will go see Gustavo because I also like him very much as a, as a person. I and. You know, but th those three that I told you would be at the top, and I, I greatly admire what they've done because each one, in a way, represents a different aspect of music. I think Blomstedt represents tradition and represents the, the kind of honesty of the old school. Gergiev represents this magic of 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 the Russian school and the you know. How does he yeah. do it? Mm. Uh, and and Sir Simon to me is a builder. Mm. Uh, he 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 seems to have gone from from inside the orchestra and and built orchestras. I guess like 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 the one you, you were part of. I mean, it's mm. a uh, so though. Let let's keep it at those three. Although I mean, if if, I, if we were if we had more time, the list could be could be long <laughs> and i also think that it's important in what i do that i know about people who i've never been able to to meet and to see one thing i don't do so much is see on the internet because it, it's it's hard for me to really judge but if i could go see um this the new conductor of the berlin, berlin philharmonic is probably someone who would impress me although mm. i i've never met him but knowing from friends of mine in the orchestra who speak greatly about him, he would be some someone. You know, there's there's so, so many good conductors today, uh, but for me, the people that I just mentioned have a um, an experience of their own that's absolutely unique. What is the hardest work you've ever conducted? I, I think that the hardest piece I've ever conducted is probably... A piece by John Adams mm -hmm. that is called Harmony Larry. Oh, you, yes. You, you know this piece, right? I've never conducted it, but I will say that oh, I was on trial for a job further up the section in the second violins early on in my career, and out of nowhere, a recording session dropped into the schedule with Simon Rattle conducting it. It was when we recorded Harmony Lara and Short Ride and whatever <laughs> else. And... I have to admit that I rather blasely thought, oh, it's John Adams, it won't be that hard. 
Oh my uh, god! Yeah. I learned my lesson, and needless to say, I did not get that job. And I, it, probably those recording sessions were a contributory factor because I couldn't play it. I couldn't get anywhere near it, and I should have practiced it. My God, what a hard piece of music that oh, is! Right. Yeah. I'll explain to you. It, 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 coming from Latin America and doing as much 20th century music and 21st century music as I do, mix meters are a breeze. Okay, yeah. it's yeah. not. It, Look, from a technical point of view, nothing nothing is harder than some of the Latin music as far as mix meters. Mm. Okay, so I no no problem. That's you know the problem with harmonilere to me and why I found it so hard uh, is because of the fact that a part of the orchestra is playing against your beat. Mm. So that you 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 are not latching on to something that helps your beat along. When you are doing straight five eights, there is a part of the orchestra that is doing a five two on top of it, and ten bars later, you're supposed to to be together on the downbeat. Mm. And I have found that's very very hard not to be swayed by the music that's against your beat and keeping these. Uh, compartmentalized rhythmic sections in your mind. So I think from a technical point of view, that piece comes to mind as one of the hardest experiences because I also had to build it from scratch with an orchestra that was the National Symphony of Mexico that is very fine orchestra, but that not used a lot, not used to that kind of music mm. and that kind of rhythmic uh, integrity or 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 precision. Yeah. So yeah. what what happens with that is that uh, the very Latin swaying of the music cannot happen in that music. No, no, okay? no, no. no. And, 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 and that's why I found it hard. Another piece that comes to mind, and it's got nothing to do with, with technical issues, is I was asked to do, uh, and was successful, I think, doing it, a piece that's called the German Symphony by Hans Eisler. I don't know if you know this, Deutsche don't, Symphony. Don't so Hans, I Hans Eisler is the name of the, of the, today is the name of the um, biggest conservatory of music in Berlin. But That's right, Eisler, yeah. Eisler was a completely East German communist composer uh, who at some point decided to do this mammoth symphony where the idiom is just brutal and it's choral and it talks about totalitarian issues like Nazism and the communist system of which he was a part. Yeah. I did it uh, at the NDR in Hamburg with fabulous singers and fabulous chorus, yet it was a very, very hard experience for me because the music was speaking about such horrendous things mm. uh, and uh, i i speak german not that well but enough to know every single one of those words and i can tell you that there is nothing in the oratorio literature that goes where that goes mm. and and that i think that was from a psychological point of view very hard and one of the hardest i can because, imagine yeah you, you know we we are in the position of conducting things and believing in, in them, okay? Uh, and I I don't know what I believe about that piece. I, <laughs> I know that after doing it, I was happy I did. Mm. Uh, a, a big part of the orchestra was also very much against doing this piece, okay? So that that's another reason why it was a difficult experience. It, it, it wasn't... It, it wasn't a popularity contest anywhere. Yeah. Yet it in it ended up being a good experience because of uh, the the extra musical factor of doing it uh, in northern Germany and the El Philharmonie with an audience that no matter what you do, they're they're gonna go for it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but that was a let's say psychological. Uh, tough experience. It and sounds, that came, sounds like it. Yeah. Th that came very little after the pandemic. Yeah. That so sounds, it, it, yeah. it, 
it's like it's like you know a boxer uh and you have the biggest boxing uh the biggest fight of your career and you're not at the best psychological moment and that you know it's, it's very easy to fall and that's that that added to the complication yeah yeah i can well imagine <laughs> it sounds like it would be tough because you have to be an advocate for something when you're a conductor you know there sometimes we have to conduct music that we don't know and we might end up not particularly liking but we have to be an advocate for it um right. and but, but in this particular case you've also come to got to convince half the orchestra by the sound of it and the choir and, and let alone the audience that it was a worthwhile experience to do because of the nature of the of the the lyrics the words i mean the the libretto yeah that's yeah. tough that really is tough um i can understand exactly why that is your answer number 7 when traveling abroad to conduct what item could you not leave home without I could not leave home without a couple of the books that I want to read and that have that I want to read in that trip and that I end up not reading. Uh, <laughs> so that, it, you know, I, I, I saw your question before and that's the one I said from the outset, I know how to answer because the yeah. only thing that I always take with me are those two books. Yeah. And, you know, for years, I'm talking about years. I took Ulysses. Okay? James Joyce. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Un until I gave up. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I think I gave up the day that I, you know, I said to someone who, who knew about literature, why is it that I don't understand and cannot get past page 30? And that person said, the same thing and then i said well that's probably way beyond 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 me and there is a musician in the houston symphony who is a ulysses expert mm. and he got me hooked into ulysses and i traveled with it for about a couple of years and now if i if i see if i show you my suitcase for my next trip there are two books and uh it's always either a book in French, English, or Spanish. Mm. Uh, and and why? Uh, because m many people may may ask themselves why. the 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 truth is that when you go on the road, when you go guest conducting, you spend quite a bit of time on your own. Yeah. So you sometimes your best friend is a book. Uh, over dinner, to, especially in a new yeah, city. Over dinner. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that that's one thing. I don't know if that's a boring answer. No, it's not. Uh, no. But <laughs> well, especially there was a lovely coda to the first sentence, which is which I, uh, I uh, you know occasionally don't don't even open because uh, sometimes you go to a new city, you go somewhere, and you think, well, I've never. This is a wonderful place. I'm going to spend a lot of time walking. You're not going to be stuck in your room reading books. Uh, you know, you may end up going for dinner with somebody rather than being on your own you know uh, right. it, it's just how it is you know i've got books i've dragged around the world with me that i've barely ever opened at all um <laughs> you know I'm, I'm on at least two recent trips i took a book with me i never opened it um because yeah. i ended up eating out with somebody else or going for a longer walk or you know whatever it might be yeah. no not boring answers at all <laughs> number eight what is the one thing you would change about being a conductor the the fact that it is not a family profession mm. okay that success in this in this business the way is the way it is today goes against you being part of the family and that you miss things that you don't want to miss mm. okay like you know your kids birthday or uh your innumerable things yeah. I, that, so that that that's one thing that i would say is the top is that it is a very hard profession on the family mm. it, it is harder on the family than on the person mm. because you are doing things and you are having fun doing them and you know it's 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 fun going to new zealand to conduct mm. uh, but it's not fun for your kids to have their 
their father not be there when everybody else's father is there. Mm. And, uh, you know, so for, for a while, this hurt a lot, especially when, when my kids were little, because we were going back and forth between New Orleans and Mexico City, and we had them in two schools, mm. which, which was very unique, okay? And, and finally, a winning situation. But it hurt to me that they could not be part of anything on a regular basis. If they were on a football team, they were always missing half of the game. Mm. Mm. Okay. Which that, that, you know, it, it seems to be very minor because, you know, of course, there are professions where the negative thing is 18 times worse. You know, we're not dealing with with a medical situation of unsurmountable conditions. And, but at least for me, that, that, that I found it to be the difficult thing. And I see that colleagues of mine today make decisions based on their families, which I understand completely, and the industry may not. Mm, so true. And, and the, the industry pushes you in a direction that ignores the importance of your family. And, and sometimes it's happened that you have a, a holiday week and suddenly, like it just happened to me, Minnesota Orchestra calls with a dream program. Hmm. And thankfully, my family is so supportive that they say, okay, let's go and we'll just have fun in, in Minneapolis instead of yeah. going skiing. Mm. Uh, but it doesn't always work out like that. Sometimes it works out that you miss things that you end up regretting. But for example, after, you know, after my first daughter, after our first daughter was, was born, I did a tour of the Netherlands, which at the moment looked like an incredible opportunity. Yet it was a three-week tour when my daughter was three weeks old. Mm. And looking back, I should have never done that tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's not come up for a long time, but I, as an answer, but it's one I you know I agree with. I mean, I look back at certain points of my life. You know, where you know I, I became assistant conductor for the CBSO when my eldest daughter was six and my youngest daughter was two, and I was basically doing two jobs. I was trying to start a fledgling mm. conducting career <laughs> whilst being sub principal second violin of the CBSO at the same time, and I did that for nine years. So basically through the whole of their childhood, I had two jobs going. Um, and I look back and think, yeah, well, maybe I should have stopped playing earlier or, or I, you know, maybe, yeah. yeah but, but yeah, I, it's, yeah, it's, it's very, very, very difficult. And I agree that at times I think our professional, the people who run our profession don't, uh, don't think about that or, or, you know, the situations that we as parents are in. Um, and especially these days, you know, there are many, many more female conductors out there conducting now than there ever was when I first started. And, you know, um, and so it's mothers and fathers. And, yeah, it's That's tough. Right. tough. Yeah. Number nine, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt or have liked to have attempted? I would have loved to be a writer. Yeah. Uh, but I never, never had the talent. Um, but uh, I think writers are make a huge difference to the world uh, so i that's that's the that's the only profession that i sometimes look at and i say oh god it, it, it must be it must be an amazing one and i've known so many writers that actually i i was i ended up being close to gabriel garcia marquez because of my parents and he said the opposite right all right so i think there is this kind of a a um, love affair between writers and musicians, yeah. uh, but it, I, I, I've never wanted to be a doctor, never wanted to be a lawyer, never wanted to be a politician. Uh, but writing, I think, is one of those things that gets better as you go along in life, and that is also so uh, free. You mm. can go anywhere and do it. Which, so that would be that would be the one. And finally, Carlos, if the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? Okay, it would start with ceviche from mm. Lima, 
Lovely. It would continue with um, some kind of Mediterranean fish. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, it would end with a Zacher Torte. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I can't think of a drink that's going to wash all three of those down. So have you got three different drinks? I do. Good. So yeah. with, with the Peruvian uh, ceviche, yeah. I would like a Peruvian beer. Bingo. Okay. Yeah. And I won't say which one because there is more than one. Yeah, and I'm with not getting the, any. With, I'm not getting any sponsorship money from them. So yeah, <laughs> uh, with with uh, fish, Spanish fish, and why Spanish? Because I like this kind of very Spanish or Mediterranean, very kind of natural way of cooking fish. I love fish. Mm. I like uh, this uh, verdejo wine from Spain, which I I love, and I think I would have a port with uh, mm. with with the zahar torte now there's a meal b and c okay mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> the the b yeah would be fully mexican okay yeah. and it would it, it it would actually start with tacos and it would continue with tamales and then it would it would finish with something with dark chocolate Okay, yes, and a, a mole or something. I'm, oh, oh. A mole. Yeah. I am not a tequila person, so I would mix with it a Spanish red wine from um, Ribera del Duero. Okay, so that's meal B. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> meal C comes directly from New Orleans. Oh. And it would and it would be start with barbecue shrimp. Yeah, <laughs> with an with an Abita amber beer. Then uh, there is a beautiful dish from uh, a restaurant. It's it's just this amazing way to cook uh, beef, and I would do that with a Cabernet. Yeah, and, and another chocolate dessert that is typical from New Orleans. So one meal would be more like Mediterranean European and uh, Peruvian. The second one would be fully Mexican, and the third one would be New Orleans. I have to say that there are about 20 others. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and within one of those 20 others, I would even include haggis. Yeah. yeah. Or haggis. I don't know how you pronounce haggis. it. Haggis. Yeah, haggis. I've okay. had haggis. I really liked haggis. Yeah. <laughs> so I end, I end up having a meal for everywhere I go. Okay. Yeah. So that's how it is. You just ask me one and I gave you three. So if you want to just use the first one, I'm perfectly content with that one. Uh, and I will use all three. <laughs> and the reason why is that my listeners know that I'm a foodie because often I, I ooh and ah and say that my mouth is watering when people give the answers. And it's been a long time since I've had somebody who basically said, I like food. And I don't matter. <laughs> I've got, I've got a favorite meal everywhere they go. What it means is that, like so often happens on this podcast, I've met somebody today I've never met before. We're looking at each other on Zoom, one in Birmingham, one in Madrid. I know that if you were ever over here or we're in the same city, we could probably go for a meal anywhere, probably end up drinking pretty much anything, and I think we'd carry on <laughs> chatting like good old friends because I know it's been great fun. Uh, thank you, Carlos, for coming on the podcast, and I do hope to bump into you somewhere soon, and we, and we know that we can eat and drink and carry on chatting. I, I, I thank you very much. And th this is a very beautiful thing that you do. And I, 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 I've had great fun doing it. Uh, and I, I, I congratulate you. And I will be near where you are because I think the residents of the uh, NYO, the uh, NYO UK, yes. is actually near Birmingham. So oh, I'm, well. I'm going to send you where it is. It, I'm, a, I'm terrible with UK geography. So... I think it is somewhere within the vicinity of where you are. Send me the address and I'll take okay. you out for dinner. It's a deal. Okay. Great. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Thank you so much. A Mic on the Podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal with music by Ben Dawson. 
Next time, I chat with a British conductor who started out, like so many others, as a chorister. He went on to start his own orchestra in 2005 and now has a flourishing guest conducting career. He's also very well known as being the current head of conducting at the Royal College of Music in London. But until then, bye-bye. <laughs>